Hello and welcome to DesignCast, a podcast where I interview a wide range of excellent guests in design and STEAM education to get their unique perspectives. My name is Jason Regan and I use my 20 plus years of experience as a design educator to dig deep into complex issues. This podcast has one simple mission, to create a community of people around the world that are interested in design and STEAM education. Each episode, I chat with guests from all corners of the design world, from classroom teachers to authors and even to educational consultants. We discuss a wide range of topics that we feel are relevant today. I do want to ask you that if you're enjoying this podcast, please leave a review, rate, subscribe, share, or download from your favorite podcasting app. This helps the podcast get discovered by listeners that might not find it otherwise. Also, it helps me to continually define the direction of future guests and episodes. Feel free to drop by my website, www.jasonreagan.ga, to leave me a comment or to sign up to be considered as a future guest on future episodes. Also, don't forget to stop by Anchor and leave me a voice clip that could even end up in an upcoming show. Thanks for listening. So let's get to it. Hey everybody, I'm Jason Reagan. I'm your host of DesignCast. And on this episode, I had the awesome opportunity to chat with James Bleach. James is the head of design and technology at Tanglin Trust School in Singapore. Many listeners will be familiar with his work and th- for with him through his creation of classroom resources that are featured on this on his website and the Facebook group known as Jamble DNT. We talk about our shared love of all things DNT and what inspires us to share our experiences. I'm confident that you will enjoy listening as much as we enjoyed chatting. On a different note, please subscribe, rate, and share this podcast. I appreciate all the kind words and support that have been rolling in so far. If you have an idea for a future episode or you would like to be a guest, please reach out through my website, www.jasonreagan.ga, and that link is in the show notes. There is a contact form on my website. I have just recently discovered that there has been an issue with the notifications on that, and so I have repaired that, and I will be in touch with the folks who've reached out to me so far that may not have gotten a response from here, and so I do apologize for that. So... I'm also trying something new with the show notes. I have an expanded uh, description for what we talk about in the podcast, and there's a link to that hyperdoc in the show notes. So please have a look and let me know what you think, because I think that's one way we can share our information in a bit clearer format. So either way, sit back, relax, and listen to this awesome chat that I have with James. Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of Design Cast. And I am just absolutely excited and totally stoked to have James Bleach here with me today. And he's coming in all the way from Singapore to chat with me today. And so I am really, really excited to have him on. And I know that those folks checking us out will know that he has got lots to share. And so, James, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and then maybe kind of how you got into teaching and, and that kind of thing? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, obviously, I've been quite open that the uh, since the remote learning period, you know, I've been getting a lot in, into podcasts and, you know, learning a bit more about design internationally. And obviously, I've come across your podcasts and, and a few others and, and really enjoy sort of getting stuck into them. So, yes, it's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, my name's James Bleach. I'm the Head of Design and Technology at Tanglin Trust School in Singapore. Been out here since 2017 and I moved over here to set up the subject as well as the well to design a conversion of a, a canteen into a DNT workshop. Started teaching originally in Leeds in West Yorkshire in the UK. I trained as a primary school teacher after a trip uh, over to the US where I, I worked in a primary school sort of painting Disney characters on the walls and lots of random things like that. I've just always loved kind of curriculum design, projects, problem solving and it, that led to me becoming the head of resistant materials uh, and then moving down to Suffolk to become the head of DNT and then I switched schools to become head of creative creative arts but I've been lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time I guess I've shared a lot of my resources online through Jamble DNT the Facebook group is a sort of main networking area and through that I've been again very lucky to be and privileged I guess to be asked to go and do little bits of work abroad for consultancy wise for the design and technology association but also as the speaker for some conferences love everything design and technology this uh, job abroad this first post is a, a big step for me and, and for my family I came with an 18 month old and in the last three years I've had another two girls and so yeah so I've got a one three and four uh, one two and four year old I should get that right um, so it's been very busy but yeah it's, it's been a pleasure you know it's, it's great working on the international scene and you know to have designed your own workshop is an absolute treat for any design teacher yeah I agree I mean I think that the opportunities that international teaching give people like ourselves to do that kind of thing to dream and to be able to see things come about is an opportunity opportunity that most people will never have in, in a national system or a public system. I think we're really lucky. And I've seen some of your work and seen what you guys have done down there. And it's really, really beautiful the stuff that you've got going on. So I hope I can come yeah. down one day when the when the Rona is done and then we can <laughs> get together. Well, yeah, I mean, you're more, you're more than welcome. I, I obviously have through my network, I have a lot of um, teachers that are flying through or are, I don't know, in Singapore on holiday and they want to pop in and, and I'm always welcoming people in. The way that I look at it sometimes, is that in any other school that I've worked in, I always have sort of dreams of things that I'd love to be able to do. When you work in a, a school such as Tanglin Trust School or many of the international schools, uh, you've got no excuse not to actually give those things a go because, you know, the resources are there, the equipment's there, the promotion of your passions and whether you want to develop your abilities. And you've got no excuse not to give these things a go. So um, that's what I'm doing. And did you always know you wanted to be a teacher or how did that kind of come about? Uh, I think, does anybody know that? they want to be a teacher I think when when I was at school um, my parents were teachers and, I, and I'd probably say that that put me off more than anything else I'm one of five and none of my brothers or sister have got involved into teaching as I said I went to America and, and I did some little bit of work in a primary school in what was it called Dudley School in Roanoke I believe it was in Virginia maybe I just loved working in that environment so when I came home I, I in fact when I got off the plane I told my parents I want to work in a primary school trained with design and technology and then we have to do a placement in the secondary and I loved it you know I loved the ability to sort of talk about design more and to look into things a bit deeper and to solve real problems because the children were a bit older and the kit was a bit better and you know you got to do DNT all day every day and that was a big game changer for me you know rather than once a week I was getting to do it all day every day so I did a PGC to switch to secondary and now weirdly I, I love working with nursery and our infants and our juniors on our site because I could go in and just do the specialist stuff you know leave everything else all the other subjects to their teachers. Yeah it's funny how we ebb and flow even in our career with the things that we're interested in and the things that we never thought we would do and then that's the only thing we could think about doing. It's, it's really yeah. strange how that works and so <laughs> Uh, so you, you've been in Singapore since 2017. If I'm not mistaken, that was when the school really had a big change and shift towards more DNT stuff. Is, is that right? Can you tell us a little bit about how kind of that process worked? Well, I mean, for, for me in the UK, I had um, spoken about creativity at a conference in Dubai in 2015. I got to know a guy called John Zobrist, who was over at UWC East, brilliant DNT teacher, a real pleasure to know him. And 
we kept in touch, you know, and, you know, networking's always been my thing anyway, but keeping in touch with him, he had said to me at the time, you need to come and work abroad. And when my wife sort of finally pushed me into looking into it, I'd emailed him and, and he, he said, well, what a coincidence, Tanglin are looking to set the subject up and to introduce it. Uh, so they had been looking into it for a few years and it turned out when I contacted them that they had attended the conference that I spoke at. So they were already aware of who I was. I'd like to say what I could do, but I suppose you never really know until you put into these different situations. But it seems to have just been a great partnership, you know, we've gone for a phased approach. So we're going for year nine in the first year, then nine and 10, 19 and 11, and we're now into nine, 10, 11, 12. I've employed my first design and technology teacher, Connor DeCourcy. I've had a technician with me all the way through, uh, Eric Liu, and we, we're we just growing the subject, you know, where, where we've had a bit more time on our timetable over the last few years. We've just been getting out there and, you know, going into each of the schools and helping them out wherever we can, doing a lot of weird and wonderful projects for, you know, all the different year groups, um, which has been, you know, usually you get asked to fix a shoe quite often, but, you know, I've been asked to make like worm farms that sit into the door frames and, you know, all sorts of weird things. It's been a pleasure. It's been the most enjoyable position by far you know throughout my career I'm really looking forward to sort of seeing the next phase of the plan where we expand to develop another workshop possibly bring in some more staff and tra change our delivery so that we can align with maybe some of the integrated tech departments in juniors and infants but also to to deliver ourselves to uh, year seven and eight Fantastic. You said you have a chance to get down to meet with some of the little ones. What kinds of things do you do when you go down to see them? <laughs> in all honesty, I think because I had a bit more time on my hands in the first year, I had one experience in the first week where I actually got lost in the school building and I was based out of the art department. And I could not find it. So I just sat on a bench and didn't tell anyone and, and just sort of worked away on my MacBook. And I made a sort of promise to myself I was going to familiarize myself with each part of the school. And the more people I got talking to, the more ideas that were discussed and you know I'd see the different environments and the nursery area in particular were doing a an award where they I can't think of it off the top of my head but it's a it's it's about sort of improving the environment and, and going for more of a I guess an intriguing environment and getting a lot more natural materials in there and they it just blew me away and I knew that my daughter would be joining there so I was really happy to get involved and I, I built them all some workbenches so that they could teach sort of basic D&T or to be working on a workbench uh, down in nursery you know just chipped away at every year group really you know I get involved with the house days I get involved with inviting them across to the workshop and delivering small sort of model making or practical activities sometimes I'm asked to go across and speak in assemblies and present how I might go about completing a project-based learning task and then you know none of that is even the senior school you know the senior school is a different thing again you know we've got got involved in so many others and we've recently joined forces with science and we hosted as soon as I arrived the 2017 International STEM Conference, where we brought people over from Adidas, Dyson School of Engineering. And it's, it's just been incredible. You know, it's just, I feel so lucky, you know, where we're positioned, it's, it's kind of STEM capital in Singapore. And it's, you know, Tangling School has an excellent reputation, one that I was completely oblivious to before I, I came out here. And the staff, you know, working with a team who are so sort of happy to be there and happy to go the extra mile. And I'm not saying, you know, other schools don't have that, but, you know, it's just, it's just just a very, very positive environment to work in. That's so great to hear. What I'm hearing from you is something that's come up multiple times on this podcast, which is about people selling the program, you know, and, mm. and making people aware, other teachers and other yeah. stakeholders in the school aware. And that yeah. sounds like you've got a great blueprint for that is, is just sort of just going for it and, and having those relationships with people. I think it's priceless to have that. And that's how you get into classrooms. And that's how people go beyond asking you to fix their shoe or to fix their, their yeah. stool that's broken. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I've it's, had those too. <laughs> In all honesty, yeah, that kind of thing still happens. You know, it doesn't matter where you are, but I feel like we're we're actually challenged more. You know, I feel like the kind of problems that people come in with, can you laser cut through my son's tooth that came out yesterday? And, you know, all these sort of weird things that sort of make me stop and laugh and then question whether or not I can do it. That's our role essentially, isn't it? It's a designer, a maker, a problem solver. So I feel that I'm growing you know, in terms of my subject knowledge and my, my team are growing as well because we are constantly fa finding ourselves being tested in ways that we never never saw coming. And yet, you know, when you when you do speak to teachers around the school, they, they have all been surprised that DNT has not been there. They've all been supportive of the introduction. And, and I talked to them, I talked to them about the new curriculum, the links within subject areas. You know, I embrace 
STEM, but I, you know, the way that I see STEM is that it should be that I am working in collaboration with science and maths and engineering. It shouldn't just be like somewhere somebody in school is running a, a small club. You know, it should be a, a, a curriculum in itself, like a way of thinking, a way of sort of communicating with other staff to better your practice. And, and I feel like that's where we're we're heading at the moment. You know, we're, we're doing some really good collaborative stuff. That's fantastic to hear. I hear so many times that design teachers feel quite alone and lonely in mm-hmm. their school. A lot of times it's it's more than just the physical location on the physical yeah. plant. A lot of times, you know, it's kind of out in the back or wherever. And so I think along with being physically closer to everyone, it's also getting more into the planning of units and, and you know, and working around different projects that teachers and, and others yeah. are having. And so, yeah, that's great, man. I, I love to hear it. And I know Singapore is a hotbed for all kinds of activities like that. And you know, <laughs> so, and I don't know how many teeth you've been laser cutting, but I'm, I'm a little concerned about that part. If you're gonna, unless you're becoming a dentist. Yeah, well, you never know. You never know. A lot of the form labs, 3D printing stuff is for dental work. So, you know, many strings to your bow and all that. So that's about you know sort of the physical plant and and sort of how you've organized yourself. But I know that you're as I can say, your bread and butter is about creating resources and creating tools that other yeah. people can use as well. And I want to thank you for what you share with everyone. And so yeah. can you tell us a little bit about kind of how you got started sharing these resources and then what's yeah. going on yeah. now? I think I always remember that when I was in school, not my own schooling, but when I, when I was training to be a teacher, um, I was always surprised walking into a classroom at how many small bits of paper were stuck on the wall everywhere that you couldn't read. You know, it might have been a pupil's work, but you couldn't physically read it and, unless you were right close up to it and and I always felt that resources and, and posters in your environment should be accessible from wherever you're stood in your classroom you know if I if I've got a, a poster that explains the parts of the machine I shouldn't be stood right next to it and expecting the kids to be able to read it from where they're sat you know I, sh- I should be able to work with my resources you know make my whole environment work for me so I started sort of looking I was actually asked by a former teacher whether I wanted a traffic light tracking system and I was like come on you know we're, we're designed teachers we've got to we've got to be able to do something a bit better than that so I started playing around with like the Monopoly board and this is many years ago and doing Mr Bleach's course with Monopoly and having like little trackers and all sorts on there and I shared that online on the Times Ed website and lots of downloads from it and I, and I was blown away really at how many but there was no feedback or I had a couple of pieces of feedback but I thought there's got to be something where we can actually be talking and developing these more so I put all my resources into Dropbox started sharing them on Facebook lots and lots of requests to join and that just made Dropbox a bit clunky and difficult to manage. So when it got to about 900, maybe 1,000 people in there, it was daily being deleted and sort of added back in by five good-natured people. And I decided just to put it all on a website. So I set jamblednt.com up, put all my resources onto there, set up a Facebook group to go with it. And that's been my prime sort of place for sharing my ideas, really. So I've always felt like the reason that I've done well, I guess, with my resources is because I've described it and talked to you before but I'm like an ideas generator you know it's, it's quite often I can be walking to my lesson and you know I've changed my mind about what I want to do the lesson on or I'm halfway through a lesson and suddenly I think about a resource or a website or a video that I saw the previous week and I switch things up not making me sound like I'm all over the place uh, in my design lessons but I guess I'm quite resourceful and I have regular good ideas for projects but I've always believed as well that you know if, if I design a resource and it doesn't work for my group it might work perfectly for a, the next group or it might work incredibly for the school down the road or for a school in another country so I've always been uh, quite keen to make things available allow people to adapt them but just you know send me a picture of, of it in use you know that's all that's all the thanks I want really is because I, I absolutely love and it's a it's a pleasure seeing you know one of my posters up on somebody else's wall or a kid learning from one of my resources you know that isn't my pupil necessarily yeah I totally agree and I don't think most teachers are in it for anything other than just that sharing spirit. And yeah. I think it's great that you're doing that. And I want to thank you on behalf of the thousands of people who have used your materials, because in many cases, people are being thrown into a situation that they're not familiar with. They're being asked, yeah. maybe they're a science teacher or a math teacher, and they're being asked to do this, this kind of stuff, especially internationally. I found that yeah. um, people yeah. get kind of caught into a situation where, oh, I helped watch the robotics team last year. And now all of a sudden I'm a design and technology teacher. And so I think that having a place to go where it's, it's designed by pure design teachers like yourself, I think it helps a lot to know that those things have been shared and that you're putting things out that people can use that are practical. 
So I think that's fantastic. And I think that we're, we're a, an incredible subject area for online collaboration. I do use Twitter, I use Instagram, and I use LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn because, you, you know, the, you get in touch with so many people that actually work in industry. And, you know, they, they somehow have seen a project you're doing and they're like, wow, you know, you're doing that in D&T. Can I come in and talk to your kids? I happen to be in Singapore. And what an opportunity that is. Twitter is is great. and But yeah, you, you know, it, it, it all depends really who you follow and what you're aiming to get out of it and whether people people who are posting stuff are they posting useful stuff who's it useful for you know there's a lot there's a lot that i analyze in this stuff and i suppose it's because i've been so involved in it so i i just look for inspiration that's all it is you know i want i want to find people that are either keen to work with me discuss ideas with me or are trying things themselves that inspire me you know something that i might want to go back in school the next day and try myself you've kind of discussed sort of the journey that you've had there and tangling trust and and in singapore and what are some of the things you have been challenged by? And then what have you sort of, how have you overcome those challenges? I think the main ones in terms of working abroad were, were just the, having the confidence to take that step to pack up your life and, and move at the other side of the world. You know, I'm, I'm from a big family and so is my wife. We had an 18 month old Ivy. And when we went for it, we, we very quickly realized that the school had a team that we, really looks after you and helps you move over so that made it easy but when we moved over here we found out that we were having another child as we moved and then had another child shortly afterwards so I suppose my challenge has been trying to retain my work-life balance when you know it's very easy to do that in Singapore don't get me wrong but bearing in mind that you know the experience that my my wife my family came over for wasn't necessarily what we'd originally planned so it, it took a you know still been amazing but it, it took a bit of a sort of side step first of all in terms of introducing the subject and getting used to the school there's the challenge of it not being taught before so most people your arms open welcoming it some of the parents needed a little persuasion which again it's a pleasure for me to do same with governors senior management you know I guess being so enthusiastic about what I do I'm coming in and I'm, I'm really you know I've, I've had a food teacher before who I used to work with who said if you weren't a DT teacher you'd be a salesperson and I can see that because you know I go in and I'm like bang 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 this is DNT this is my dream this is what I want to do and usually they're just like okay where did you find the time to to come up with that CAD model for the whole of the department or how have you thought about this how have you done that how have you done that and but you do it because you love it. You know, it's, it's sort of in your blood, isn't it, to, to create these things. So I guess, you know, the, the challenge, another challenge is that nothing's set in stone. Now, I've got used to that here as well. For me to come in and somebody was to go out, you know, you, you realise that it's, although people are aware of what's happening, you're very aware that you are on a small contract, you know, in terms of years. It might be one, two, three. Whereas in, the, in England or in the UK, there's, there's always been quite a lot of job security, I guess. Now, it made me think, you know, what if it doesn't go well? You know, what if I have to move? And then, you know, on the flip side to that, I think, well, I'm going to make sure that I'm staying here. I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm growing the subject. I'm going to make sure I'm expanding because that's what I came here to do. And um, so if there's a challenge, you just treat it like a designer does and you, you know you do that design process I guess in your head automatically or you have your sketchbooks and you, you're constantly sort of thinking about things for the future uh, or how you're going to solve little problems and, and when people see you doing that that's a, that really is a skill it's not just delivering your knowledge on a subject it's seeing you living your subject and I think yeah that helps massively totally agree and you know there's a little bit of excitement too about having short-term contracts is that you know you can always pick up and go somewhere else or try something new or you know there's a lot there's there's a real need for design teachers and design uh, and technology folks all over the world at the moment. And it's only growing. So, you know, I think that, yeah, but I understand there's, it is a little scary to not have the security <laughs> that you'd have in a, in, a, in a state system or a national system. Yeah, it, it was just new to me. But at the same time, you, you look at the situation that we've just been through with remote learning. And I thought, you know, I've got three toddlers at home. How am I going to deal with this? And that's the first time I'd probably say that I've been a little bit anxious with my job because it blurred the line of sort of work and home life I just took it as a, a problem to solve again so uh, but as soon as you realize you can have a background to, to help blur out your screen you know I was using new software like Microsoft Teams and I thought well let's set up a, a set up a, a separate team for D&T teachers uh, and I invited various teachers in who needed the help or 
who wanted to help. And then in between every lesson, we were downloading apps within Teams and we were experimenting with them, trialing them in lessons, recording videos, dropping them into this team. And, you know, again, if that helped one teacher, then I've done something good there. But I put all the videos together, made them accessible online so that anybody that is in remote learning or is continuing to use Teams can, you know, hopefully learn something from them, you know, do something better with them by all means. I almost feel like this next question is a bit of a moot point because I think you've already kind of hit it, but what are you really, really excited about at the moment in anything, uh, teaching or whatever? It's difficult because I'm a, I'm a bit of a big kid in the classroom. It's, I see my job, my day-to-day -day stuff, teaching children my hobby and what an absolute pleasure it is and a privilege it is to do that. So I'm excited just to walk into, to open my classroom door. It will sound very cheesy, but to open my classroom door in the morning and see this incredible workshop. But I know that I've designed a year ago a few years ago on my ipad you know it's brilliant every day is brilliant so you know i'm excited about sort of the new year groups that we've got i'm excited about refreshing my teaching practice with the new stuff that have come in i'm excited about um you know new problems to solve and new new gcse neas that you know allow children to sort of come up with new things so i just i don't know i'm just generally excited about design technology i have been for about 11 years now i think so probably a bit longer but yeah i think uh, the day the day that i lose that is the day that maybe I think about you know the, the direction that I'm taking but I can't see that happening to be honest I've had opportunities to leave the classroom before although I like sort of dipping my foot into that water and doing a little bit of consultancy there's, there's nothing better than being back in your own room and when the kids have gone home for the day and you can just sort of tinker with with some of the machinery and some projects yourself all your lessons during the day it's just, it's just there's, there's nothing like it to be honest it's a thread that I see running throughout all these episodes that I've recorded with great folks like yourself that it's almost always the same. I could almost script <laughs> at this point what everyone's going to yeah. say because if you don't love this, you get out of it pretty quickly because yeah. it's just too much work if you don't love it. And so yeah. I think it's great. And I don't think you're, I don't think you're like a car salesman, James. I think you're much better than that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we do have to know, sell our, we have yeah. to sell the program, man. <laughs> yeah, of, of course we do. And, and at the end of the day, it, it's just passion. You know, if you're, if you are genuinely passionate about what you do, you can't help but steer conversations onto it. You know, you can't help but you know if, if you don't think somebody gets it then enforcing your point and saying look at this look at this look at this look at what we can do but even sort of ex experimenting myself you know I love learning new bits of software and new bits of kit and just seeing what ideas come out of that you know I, lo I love training or delivering textiles I've delivered food before I've, I don't love them all as much as kind of product design but you know I like learning new things speaking of new things what are you learning right now what's really exciting that you're learning now like an ed tech tool or anything like that I've been very lucky since starting here that we have we've had access to sort of you know fairly new Mac Suite and uh, Fusion 360 and we've sort of been blasting that a little bit and I want to get really really good at that you know I, I, do, I feel very confident in it and I have good ideas for projects but I'd love to I'd love to have a look at generative design you know I find that fascinating sorry if I go back to like a, a, some of the video resources that I've used like um, the Big Life Fix and people on there who if you don't know the Big Life Fix please look it up on YouTube and, and obviously we can have a link for it but I've used it so much and it really does hit home with children what this subject is about and what careers it can lead into. And there's a guy called Jude Pullen on there who has worked on for various companies, Dyson, on various projects. He's done a lot with Arduino. And I've been watching, he's, he's posted lockdown lectures. They're brilliant. They're so good to watch. He did them for Bangor University's product design. He's done like a couple of series now that you can watch on YouTube. And he, he keeps pushing Arduino. And I, I guess I never really had a much of a knowledge of Arduino, but now I'm buying in all this kit and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking about the potential for prototypes and projects. And I'm just thinking, you know, I seriously need to sit down and, and just focus on this, get it embedded into our, our kids nice and early into their curriculum. And then by the time they're doing GCSE and A-level, they're, they're going to be sort of creating some phenomenal Stuff. There's so many entry points to Arduino. I mean, all the way from mm. the physical to the the more coding end of things and stuff. So I really yeah. love that that's so customizable. I totally agree with yeah. you on that one. What kinds of projects you think you could see using the Arduino for? I don't know. Uh, when I trained teachers back in the UK for Cambridge University, there was a guy called Bill Nickel who runs the course and he still does. He's probably been one of the most inspirational people that I've worked with in terms of his approach towards research and the curriculum. I loved training teachers for him and I loved working with his trainees he he was all about avoiding fixation but he was bringing in things like real life projects you know real users with real needs and he did a he's done a project called designing our tomorrow or the doc project the Cambridge doc project and 
and it's like the arthritis simulation gloves and it's the restricted vision and it's the he does a, one with an inhaler case and and all of them have inspired some sort of design work with my projects in the past the things that i've picked up from him i will take forward and, and then when you drop in something like arduino and the sensor systems that come from it i only have to look at the packet without even unboxing it and i'm reading the different types of sensors and i'm, I'm already going wow look at this you know object avoidance sensor how exciting is that and, you know i don't i don't even know how to wire them up but i can't wait to look i am with you man i've got one sitting there waiting for me to unpack and <laughs> play around with i'm with you yeah. and so you started talking about where you get inspiration and who those folks are and yep. thank you for hitting on those is there anything else you want to add on where you get your inspiration from i would say the what, what i love is is the power to connect and the power to collaborate and i have worked with uh, some some brilliant trainees in my time and some, some brilliant teachers as well some people stick around like a very good friend in Dave Borza who uh, goes by the name of Top Brum DT. He's even more of a child than I am I think you know he's even more excitable and regularly we're like I wake up in the morning and there's messages from him and I'm leaving messages at the end of the evening here. We're collaborating through Google Drive on, on projects and um, so we've been doing that for a good few years now. Um, there's people like Kerry Truman on Twitter. He's phenomenal. He's a lead uh, forgive me if I get his title wrong but I think he's a lead technician at Nottingham Trent University and he basically experiments 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 you know he will try stuff that you don't have the ability or the equipment to do for the sake of trying it out and he'll send you a video of what he's tested and he's, he's almost like I see him as a global technician because he's just willing to help anybody and and I suppose that you know that means quite a bit to me anyway because I like that idea of you know if, if somebody is stuck a design technology teacher I, d I don't like the thought of anybody feeling stuck feeling like there isn't somebody that they can go to for for help you know I want to if I'm more experienced in any way whether it's skill or the years of teaching then if there's something that I can help somebody with then then I want to I want to do it but yeah there's a lot of people online that I've failed to mention but you only have to follow my feeds to to see who I'm retweeting and what I'm liking but in terms of people online you know I, I, I'm loving the podcast as I've mentioned I really enjoyed listening to yours and the you know MYP and IB and finding out more about it uh, but there's one by Dr. Alison Hardy uh, in the UK as well talking DNT who's the head of the Design Technology Association Tony Ryan he does one he's just started one called designed for life anybody really i suppose the magic now is that if you see a program and you've got a, a, I don't know, a celebrity designer a celebrity maker there's nothing stopping you from actually getting in touch with them nowadays you know we've got a great upcycler in in max mcmurdo in our, our facebook group who came and spoke in dubai as well and he's he's regularly on the tv doing some incredible and creative stuff and you know he's he's very much stuck around in this group he'll happily comment on stuff and share his ideas as well and i love it i love just the fact that people are able to connect you know if somebody inspires you get in touch with them it'll only ever be a compliment and you know it's interesting that you mentioned that design for life podcast because i came across that this week and i'm really 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 enjoying listening to that i think that first episode yeah. was just really well done and i'm so excited that there's more and more people putting it out there because creating content's a bit scary but at the same time yeah. it's because you know there's that worry that is it good enough are people gonna like it is it, you know are yeah. people gonna say bad things about me or whatever but in the end people are thirsty for content especially in a field that's as broad as as dnt is and so i think that to have yeah. any kind of content we can create is just helping to make the field better and to learn from each other and yeah. i agree with you the more we can get in touch with actual designers and and actual yeah. you know makers is really huge advantage for us and the yeah, internet is just amazing for that. I think a, a good thing with what you're doing as well is the, and I suppose it, it came out mostly from being able to connect with the one that you did with David Ardley recently, because I've spoken to him many times online, but what you do lose a little bit in social media is that you are just typing, you're typing away all the time. Uh, you know, you're reading people's comments, you become familiar with people. I've always respected David's opinions and to, to actually listen to him, you know, for a good few minutes talking about him, it was just a real pleasure. You know, it, it's nice to know you get confirmation on some of your own opinions sometimes and that feels comforting because you you know sometimes you don't know if you know is it does everybody share my view does everybody share my opinion but you know they, they don't need to it is nice to hear people who do that yeah i'm gonna have dave's video up pretty soon so i'll make sure to text yeah. you when that comes out because it's yeah, the same yeah. episode but it's fun to watch people too when you've never yeah. met them in the flesh it's good to hear them and see them and you go oh, okay i feel even more close to them at that yeah. point and so i love the the closeness that podcasts brings i find that i feel like i know the people really well by listening to podcasts you know yeah definitely and you do during the remote learning period when we were allowed back into school and i started 
started playing these podcasts just through my headphones, uh, just on my own in the classroom. It felt like you were back in a DNT staff room many years ago and you're just sort of listening to the conversations going on in the background and you, you almost feel like you can pipe in a, a, a pipe up at some points and yeah, you sort of lose yourself into them a little bit. And But I've really enjoyed it, you know, whether I'm on the MRT home and listening or whether, you know, I'm going up to the shop in the evening or, or whether I'm just sat planning, you know, it's, it's you know, a real credit to you and a real credit to the other people uh, who are putting them together. You know, they, they are good and I think you, like you said before, you don't you don't know if people are going to enjoy them necessarily. I, for one, am encouraging people to listen, and I think the more that you do, the more that you get into them, don't you? Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Makes me want to keep doing it. <laughs> so thanks, James. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> so listen, I know that your time is valuable, and you've got a young family to get home to, and you know, I I really really do appreciate your time, and I'll make sure that all the resources we've shared, plus any of the extras on how to get in touch with you and things, are included in the show notes. And so yeah. thank you. So so much. I hope to follow up with you, maybe have another episode later on to see kind of how things are yeah, going yeah, with the program. Cool. And I'd love to yeah. catch back up and maybe we can have a big jam session, me, you and Dave sometime all at once. That would yeah. be kind of cool, right? And so, <laughs> hey, we can make yeah. that happen. And so thank you so much. I do appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk with us today, James. Oh, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that episode of DesignCast. I'm Jason, your host, and I produced and created this podcast. If you have any input, I would love to hear from you. And I look forward to seeing you again really soon. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. We will see you on the next episode.